Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Danielle Packer. I am an Associate Clinical Professor in the Department of Pathology, Anatomy, and Laboratory Medicine at West Virginia University. Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on Antinuclear Antibody Testing. In this pearl, we will start with a definition of antinuclear antibodies, or ANA, and clinical disease states with strongest association to ANA. We'll look at different techniques employed in ANA testing, with emphasis placed on the gold standard testing technique, as well as benefits and limitations of these techniques. Finally, we'll look at current clinical recommendations for ANA testing and reporting practices. ANA are defined as autoimmune antibodies that bind to epitopes in the cell nucleus. In most healthy individuals, these components are viewed by the immune system as self and evade immune attack. However, in patients with a significant derangement of immune self-recognition, production of autoantibodies can result in clinical illness. Listed here are some of the major classes of nuclear components that are targeted by ANA. Keep in mind that over decades of research, over 150 discrete epitopes have been identified, making ANA a diverse group of antibodies. The American College of Rheumatology, or ACR, strongly recommends testing for ANA in a patient only after a clearly established clinical suspicion of an associated disease state is developed. Thus, ANA should support diagnosis largely for the conditions and indications listed in the table shown, rather than serving as a screening tool for the general population. Note that some of the conditions listed deem ANA results useful for diagnosis, whereas others have ANA positivity listed as a criterion for diagnosis. Several conditions have weaker associations to ANA positivity in terms of diagnosis, but employ ANA testing for monitoring disease status and assessing prognosis. The first of the modern ANA testing methods is the indirect immunofluorescence assay, or IFA. Briefly, ANA in the patient serum are allowed to bind to corresponding nuclear epitopes in human epithelium-derived HEP2 cells on microscope slides. Fluorophore conjugated detection antibodies bind the ANA that are bound to the cells, and the slide is viewed with a fluorescence microscope. Typically, testing employs a dilution series, starting with a 1 to 40 or 1 to 80 minimal dilution that doubles with each additional dilution prepared. When positive, the staining pattern is reported along with the highest reportable dilution, giving a positive fluorescent signal. Because the highest reportable dilution for IFA must be established by the testing laboratory, reporting limits can vary from laboratory to laboratory according to local protocols. Over the years, variability in IFA testing and reporting practices pointed out a need for standardization. The International Consensus on ANA Pattern, or ICAP, answered the call and has published several consensus documents. The ICAP initially gathered expert consensus regarding 28 distinct IFA patterns found in ANA testing, categorizing them first by nuclear, cytoplasmic, and mitotic findings, and then by general pattern and complexity. Since the initial release of the classification system in 2016, additional consensus documents released by ICAP have given negative results as a classification number, such as AC-0, addressed the reporting of as-yet unidentified patterns, and designated a new classification for the DNA topoisomerase 1 pattern, AC-29. With this background in mind, here are some relatively common examples of IFA staining patterns for ANA. With their associated ICAP classifications, ICAP's website, www.anapatterns.org, offers free registration and excellent educational resources, as well as access to images for HEP2 ANA patterns. It is a long overdue training tool available in several languages and created and maintained by ICAP members. ICAP's permission to use images from the website is much appreciated. Standardization of pattern reporting for ANA is important clinically. Universal language about ANA results can point providers to targeted subserology testing to determine which antigens may be associated with the pattern. This in turn can point to the likely clinical disease and aid in diagnosis, evaluating prognosis, and or monitoring patients with known disease. Shown here as examples are the first five ICAP classification numbers with HEP2 IFA pattern, likely antigens targeted, and likely disease associations. The benefits of IFA include clinically relevant information about pattern and relatively good clinical sensitivity. 
The limitations of the IFA technique involve specificity for disease, particularly for weekly positive test results. Preparation is still manual at most testing sites, with specimens typically batched for cost and workflow reasons. This can prolong turnaround time and delay result reporting. IFA automation is available, but it is expensive. Also, the IFA method requires relatively advanced local technical expertise for testing and interpretation, and a dark or light shielded space for optimal visibility of fluorescence patterns. ANA testing's first modern evolutionary shift came with enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. When testing ANA with ELISA, epitopes are either cloned or extracted from source material, such as HEP2 cells, and coated on solid phase wells. ANA and the patient serum are captured when they bind corresponding epitopes, and an enzyme conjugated detection antibody binds the ANA. Signal is generated from a reaction driven by the enzyme on the detection antibody and is captured and measured with a colorimetric detector. Signal obtained from a patient specimen is compared to a decision point determined by the analytic calibration and an index, or cutoff, is used to determine if ANA are present or not. ELISA-based testing for ANA can take two different forms. The first form of ANA testing with ELISA can serve as a general screening assay. This is made possible by presenting HEP2 cell or nuclear homogenates or a blend of purified common antigens in the assay wells. The second form of ELISA-based ANA testing serves to target specific antigens associated with IFA staining patterns. This approach is called subserology testing, and it commonly serves as a second-line test after a positive ANA pattern is detected. The benefits of ELISA-based ANA testing include the ability to automate, avoidance of dilution series if using the testing for screening, and reagents that are relatively inexpensive. Also, the level of technical expertise required to perform the testing and report results is lower. Assay cutoffs are typically engineered for maximal clinical sensitivity, and high plate capacities allow for large batches, making for efficient work in high-volume laboratories. The limitations of ELISA-based ANA testing include widely variable clinical performance due to lacking test standardization and differences in solid phase preparation. Also, due to the engineering of these methods to seek high clinical sensitivity, the specificity and overall clinical accuracy of ELISA can be poor. ELISA-based ANA results yield limited clinical information beyond a binary positive or negative output, so they require further testing to determine the clinical relevance of the results. Finally, ELISA performs best when automated, and available platforms are relatively expensive. ANA testing evolved again in the early 2000s with multiplexed immunoassay, or MIA, approaches. MIA uses all the same ideology as ELISA, but advances the technique by presenting epitopes on beads that are individually detectable on the analytic system. For example, if a positive IFA points to a need for subserology testing of several epitopes, ELISA-based testing would require a separate ELISA batch for each epitope, but MIA-based testing could cover most or all of these epitopes in a single test batch. Most MIA for ANA include 10 to 12 of the most commonly detected subserology antigens. Fluorescent signal from one or more beads representing these markers can enable reporting for the specific antigen yielding the signal. As for ELISA-based ANA testing, MIA reports are typically qualitative with index-based cutoffs driving the interpretation. The benefits of MIA-based ANA testing are derived from their intrinsically automated nature and placement on random access analyzers, giving them rapid cycle times. Also, linking signal to specific epitopes can allow for more specific pattern-like reporting of results. The limitations of MIA-based ANA testing are also derived from the way the modern systems are designed. Primarily, only limited numbers of epitopes are currently included in MIA-based ANA methods, creating problems for clinical performance in terms of sensitivity and specificity when compared to IFA and ELISA techniques that use HEP2 nuclear homogenate as substrate. Consequently, MIA is not recommended as a screening test for ANA. Another feature of MIA which limits its use in ANA testing is the expense of the testing systems on the market, which are currently considered high. With all of these testing options, it would seem difficult to determine which method is the right fit for a laboratory. Something one must consider is the ACR's position statement about testing methods for ANA. This position statement, most recently reviewed and reapproved in 2015, maintains that IFA is the gold standard method for ANA testing. 
Consequently, regardless of the first-line testing involved at an institution, IFA is likely to remain the definitive method in the eyes of specialist providers. Also, due to the known limitations of ELISA and MIA-based ANA methods, laboratories using these technologies in particular need to demonstrate equivalent or improved clinical sensitivity compared to IFA and have data available for provider review. In addition to these points, the ACR also calls for standardization of ANA testing methodology, reporting practices for ANA and subserology testing, and a uniform practice of naming the method used for testing in result reports. In conclusion, we have discussed ANA testing in the framework of confirming the presence of clinical connective tissue disease and assisting clinical specialists in this task. We have explored various testing modalities in use currently for detecting ANA, with the greatest emphasis placed on IFA, and listed the strengths and limitations of each. We are reminded that though many methods currently exist for ANA testing, IFA remains the gold standard for clinical utility, and that ICAP is leading the effort to standardize reporting for this method. Finally, we have reviewed the American College of Rheumatology's call for improved laboratory transparency regarding ANA testing methods used. The most important elements to keep in focus are how the tests are used and performed clinically, since both of these have large impacts in the clinical spectrum. Thank you for joining me on this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine, Anti-Nuclear Antibody Testing. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.